All right, today we're going to pick up um, talking about thresholds. So carrying over from the idea of selective attention um, and how we use that initially to understand the world around us, psychophysics also carries over and kind of piggybacks off that and uses how the physical world, um, the physics of life, and the psychology, the sensation, and the perception um, interact. So the, our technical definition of psychophysics is the study of relationships between the physical characteristics of stimuli, such as their intensity and our psychological experience of them. Um, so this is a more and more growing field as we are you know, starting to really alter and play with the physical properties of things. Um, so for instance, um, digital music is something that psychophysicists studied a lot and what compression and conversion rates um, were best for the the sensory the, the flawless sensory kind of interpretation of those um, of that stimulus um, so with thresholds one of the basic things with thresholds is something called the absolute threshold so the absolute threshold um, is the minimum stimulation so the minimum amount of sensory experience you need necessary to detect a particular stimulus 50 percent of the time so when we're talking about absolute thresholds this is what we're talking about can you detect it half of the time um, and if you can when you hit that 50 percent mark that's kind of what we determine so it's things like you know a b wing dropping on your cheek from um, an inch or one drop of scent in a in a room or you know seeing a candle three miles away on a clear calm night so you know each of our senses has what we consider what we call an absolute threshold and all of us kind of have our own absolute thresholds depending on our own kind of sensory um, flaws or things that we're good at um, so the signal detection theory is one way that one of the things we use to detect thresholds so the signal detection theory is uh, the theory predicting how and when we detect the presence of a faint stimulus or the signal amid, among, among background stimulation or noise. This assumes that there is no absolute threshold and that a person that detection depends partially on a person's experience, expectations, motivation, and alertness. So the signal detection theory basically is the ratios of hits to false alarms and then how does the environment influence it? So you know for instance a, um, a woman who, you know, in her adolescence and in her early 20s could sleep through a hurricane banging down her wall, all of a sudden she becomes a mother and the slightest whimper from her child could wake her out of her deepest sleep. Um, so, you know, is that does that have to do with the environment? Is she a mother now? Is she more in tuned to certain sounds versus, you know, before? Or, you know, maybe she still can sleep through a hurricane, but the baby will wake her up. So we've also we also talk about something called subliminal stimulation and and basically anytime you're talking about something subliminal you're talking about something below the threshold. So subliminal st stimulation is is somewhat controversial because you know we say well if it's below the threshold are we really are we really detecting it are we really perceiving it you know but obviously if the absolute threshold says 50% of the time well the other 50% of the time you're not perceiving it so you know what's what's going on there. So there's been a lot of controversy with subliminal messages and, and we'll take a look at that in just a second. Um, now priming is basically the activation often unconsciously of certain associations thus predisposing one's perception memory or response. Um, so for instance you know there was a big deal in movie theaters that um, they were implanting subliminal messages into the movie theaters before the um, before the film thinking that they were getting brainwashing people to go and buy candy and stuff like that. Well it's actually more of priming when you know you see the dancing popcorn and you see that the nice juicy coke with the water coming down and things like that what it's really doing is activating the memory of how delicious popcorn and soda is or candy is and so because of that it's calling your attention to your want for those things so you know in terms of subliminal persuasion 
Yeah, there's there's a lot of um, controversy about whether or not that could actually happen. You know, for a while there was this big thing about you know subliminal messaging tapes. You know, listening to a tape while you were sleeping, and it will change get you to quit smoking or get you to stop eating so you lose weight. And you know, p there's really no scientific evidence that any of those things work. So let's take a look, um, a listen to a couple of things. So um, one of the other subliminal messages, uh, things that have happened is um, in music. People have accused lots of musical artists over the years of um, implanting subliminal messages. So Stairway to Heaven is one of the most famous. Let's take a listen. So again, this is an example of the fact that, you know, uh, so when you listen to it backwards, is there really a hidden message or is by reading the words, is that what's causing, you know, you to hear those things. One way to test this obviously is to rewind a little bit and shut your eyes and listen to the backwards plane and can you really hear what the words are saying. Um, here's another one, Queen. What do you hear? <laughs> so, and of course, we can't forget about Jay Z. Um, so he, you know, his controversy obviously was, you know, even though the '80s um, rock music was big, the '60s, '70s, '80s, Jay Z's not forgotten. This brother has a very disturbing message in this song. I'm gonna let y'all hear it. Can I let y'all hear it? Y'all listen. Six, six, six. <laughs> Six, six, six. So whether or not that's true or not and how often you listen to music backwards, um, you know, is there subliminal messages or is that all just the power of priming? By putting the words up there, by putting the suggestion up there, are we kind of priming our brain to hear things that we should? 
Now, another, um, another part of threshold is something called the difference threshold. And the difference threshold, sometimes referred to as something called the just noticeable difference, um, basically talks about the minimum difference between two stimuli required for detection. So we experience the difference threshold as the just noticeable difference. Now, what this means is it's the change. It is what is the amount of change that has to occur between the stimulus in order for you to notice that change. So, you know, for instance, if I have um, nothing in my hand and I were to add, you know, put one finger on it, would I notice that I have placed a finger? Yes. Now, if I add a second finger to that, would I notice it as much? Well, probably not. Um, because, you know, the difference is not that noticeable. So the, just, the difference threshold talks about this idea is what is the minimum amount of change that needs to occur in order for us to detect the threshold. Now, with that is something called Weber's Law. Now, Weber's Law is the principle that we must per be that to be perceived as different, two stimuli must differ by a constant percentage rather than a constant amount. So we're not saying that for every five fingers that I add, I'm going to detect difference. What I'm saying is that there has to be a certain percentage. Now, what goes along with that also is every time I add a finger, I reset that. So then to add again, I would have to add more because I've already added the one. So Weber's Law basically just talks about a const the, the percentage of change that needs to occur in order for us to notice the difference. So Weber's Law and the difference threshold kind of act together. So another example of the just noticeable difference, as I scroll through the sli slide, see if you can tell the difference between the first, the or the words that show up, and then the next set of words. So what happens is, is that the difference between the first one and the second one is, is not very noticeable. It's very, very subtle. Now the difference between the second and the third, again, and as we go through, we can start to see that it definitely becomes more prominent. It definitely becomes more noticeable from the first one. But in between the two, okay, there's just a very slight change. So again, an example of the just noticeable difference. Now, sensory adaption is similar to this. Now, sensory ad adaption is kind of a common sense um, idea where, you know, diminished sensitivity as a consequence of constant stimuli. Those of you that always wear a hat, those of you that wear glasses, have a piece of jewelry that you wa uh, wear all the time, you don't even realize it's there because you have become adapted to the sensations that it provides for you. Now look at the things. What?